Hello, I'm Steve Goldman, and I <clears throat> wanted to um, thank the Winter Park Voice, its editor, Ann Mooney, its staff, and all the volunteers for creating this great event. <clears throat> and before I introduce Ann, I wanted to uh, just tell you about something I think is interesting. I, Every so often, my friend and neighbor, Pete Weldon, and I meet at Starbucks, and we try to find something we can agree on. <laughs> <coughs> and one thing Pete always says to me <coughs> is, Gee, you know, I think the Winter Park voice should be more objective. And, <coughs> and I, you know, I can't understand, Pete and I are totally objective about everything. <coughs> <coughs> but somehow we end up disagreeing on a lot of things. And so how is that possible? Well, I think the answer is that there is no such thing as totally objective. There's lots of room for honest men and women to disagree, and that's what this is all about. But uh, Pete and I, although we disagree a lot, we respect each other's intellectual capabilities, and uh, that's the spirit that I think we should all have here. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce the illustrious editor of the Winter Park Voice, Ann Mooney. And I will tell you, a crowd like this makes me proud to be a citizen of Winter Park. It really does. Thank you for being here. Your moderator tonight is Michelle Levy, who is co-president of the Orange County League of Women Voters. Michelle believes all citizens have an, uh, an obligation to participate in their government by doing at least two things. First, you gotta vote. You don't vote, you don't get to complain about the results. <laughs> the other thing is speak out on issues that are important to you. Michelle exemplifies the words of the founder of the League of Women Voters, Carrie Chapman Catt, who said, to the wrongs that need resistance, to the right that needs assistance, to the future in the distance, give yourselves. And I give you Michelle Levy. Thank you, Anne. That was a lovely introduction. Um, a little bit about the uh, League of Women Voters. We're an, an organization that in less than five years will be celebrating our centennial. But our battle for suffrage began in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848 when only white men who owned property were eligible to vote. We still are fighting the battle for universal suffrage for all eligible voters, and part of that battle involves contributing to informing the public about the candidates who are running for office on the state and local level. The League is committed to educating citizens on laws and policies that impact our community at the local level. We are nonpartisan in that we never support or oppose any candidate but we do take positions on issues. As a moderator of this debate, let me be clear that I do not live or vote in Winter Park, and I am completely impartial on the outcome and the issues. This debate is being sponsored by the Winter Park Voice, and all the questions come from their editorial board and their readers. We are using the League of Women Voters format for this debate. The candidates will start speaking in alphabetical order, with the two candidates for mayor going first and the city commission candidates going last. So the order for the introductions will be Stephen Leary, Cynthia McKinnon, Gary Brewer, and Greg Seidel. There will be a two minute opening statement and a two minute closing statement for each candidate. There will be three questions for each candidate, followed by three questions from the readers of The Voice. Each candidate will have one minute and 30 seconds to answer these questions. Any questions requiring rebuttals will be one minute, and our timekeeper will be Louise Wiener. Louise, just raise your hand. She's right up here, and please keep an eye on her. She's got signs, and when she, the sign says stop, <laughs> please stop. Can you hold up the signs, please? So, yes, that's 30 seconds, right? And then the red one is the stop sign. Just bring that up slow. 
So we will begin with our opening statements. Mr. Leary, you will go first. Thank you all very much for being here this evening. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Steve Leary. I've been a city commissioner in Winter Park for four years now. I've been the vice mayor for three of those years, as selected by the rest of the commission. I want to thank uh, my everyone for being here, as I said, but I also want to thank my wife, who couldn't be here because she's home taking care of our nine-year-old triplets. We came down a few years back and visited my brother, who's been a longtime resident of Winter Park, and we decided this is where we wanted to start our family and raise our family. So we moved back. We moved down here, and um, I joined my brother's business. We have a property management business here in Winter Park. I also have a business called Flange Skillets International, and we make gasket positioning devices for the oil and gas pipeline sector. So I'm a small businessman. I operate our businesses right out of here in Winter Park. I have 26 employees. Quickly to talk about the city in the past four years and what we've done. I said a couple years ago I was going to focus on a few things. One was financial. I think the city, I know the city, is in tremendous financial shape. Best financial shape this city has ever been in. We have $12.3 million in the bank. We have not raised your taxes in six years. We have 28% of our general fund in reserve. We've done a great job. I also said that I was going to worry about some improvements. We have the first urban forestry management plan ever in the city of Winter Park. The trees are incredibly important to this city. We are taking care of them like never before. Secondly, parks. Parks are always important, especially as a father of young children who utilize every park in this city. I said we we're going to take care of the parks. Last year we were a gold award finalist across the entire nation for our parks. Very proud of that. And our corridors. I said we we're going to take care of our corridors. People told me you're crazy trying to, take, trying to fix Fairbanks. I promise you in a couple of years you will be proud to tell people to get off at Fairbanks. And it's because of the work we've done over the past couple of years. Lastly, development. Right place, right time. We need development in the city of Winter Park to offset the tax burden on the citizens of Winter Park. There's a right place for it, and I'm going to tell you too tonight, we're going to talk about exactly what it is, and I'm going to talk to you about the work that we've done with some of the property owners to make this city better and make every project better. Thank you all very much. I look forward to a good evening. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. This is a wonderful crowd, and thank you also to the League of Women Voters. Let me start by answering the question that everybody always seems to want to know the answer to first. Why am I running? I'm running because I think you deserve a city government that guards your tax dollars and spends and invests in ways that reflect your priorities and in ways that protect the value of probably our most significant asset our home, and our residential neighborhoods. I'm running because you also deserve a city government that guards and protects the special place that we live in. We have so many assets that for 125 years we've cared for and enhanced with our lakes, our parks, our beautiful brick streets and residential neighborhoods, and also the uni unique places that we have here our uh, golf course, our Park Avenue, our Central Park, our library, all of those things make our set city such a special and unique place. I'm also running because you deserve a government that's working hard to implement a vision that protects the things that we hold valuable now, but also enhances opportunities for our children and grandchildren so that they will want to live here too. I also am running because you deserve a government that is respectful, inclusive, that values your input and cares about the things that you care about. I have the training, the education, the experience, the temperament that will enable me to deliver the kind of city government that you deserve. Thank you. Uh, no, I've got a lavalier in my town, this, <coughs> so I don't have to hold that. Uh, first of all, thank you, Ann, for having us here today, and, and thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Gary Brewer. I had the honor, and you uh, were able to elect me from uh, 1982 to 1993 as your city commissioner, and then and as mayor in 1993, I served one term as, as mayor, and I'm 
grateful for that opportunity. One thing I learned during this time while I was on the commission that, uh, you know, this is a very, very special place to live. You know, and every community, every institution is, is based upon a, a foundation of values that they have identified. And those values began at the very, very beginning with, uh, with uh, uh, Chapman and Chase who found this community and uh, identified the lakes and wanted, had a vision of a New England community. Uh, people like um, William Comstock who became the president of the Board of Trade uh, James Seymour Capon, who planted the first trees on, on, on Park Avenue as a public and uh, community project uh, organized by the Chamber of Commerce or the Board of Trade there. Lucy Cross, who brought, wanted, had a vision of bringing a college to this community. The, um, Charles Morris, we can't forget, a benefactor of this community for parks and all the things that we, we cherish in this community. Places like this building, sites for places like this building, because he, he knew that people needed a, a place to congregate and to, and to have conversations. And that's what that's all about. And I've also learned that everything that the city commission does should be measured against those, that, those core values. And, um, and so and it's just a very, very careful, balanced approach to everything we do. I've been a very collaborative leader, and I look forward to uh, uh, continuing in that. I have three areas that I think that uh, we talk about growth and, and, um, and development. I think it has to be balanced. We ha can't go through these cycles where we stop everything for five or six years and then we go full throttle for another five or six years. We've got we to settle that down and be a little bit steadier. So I look forward to having our conversation tonight. Thank you. All right. Um, good evening, and you know, thank you everyone for being here uh, this evening. You know, since I announced my campaign, there's been two questions that I'm often asked. One is one of the debates, and two is why did you decide to run? Obviously, this answers one of the first questions, <laughs> and I would like to say thank you to the Winter Park Voice as well as the League of <laughs> Women Voters for hosting this great event, and we appreciate everything that y'all do within the uh, um, community. Um, before answering the second question, though, I'd like to give you all a little background about myself. Uh, my father worked on the Navy base. I grew up in, in Altamont Springs. I went to Lehigh University, where I received my master's and bachelor's in civil engineering. I've been a civil engineer for the last 26 years, mostly here within the state of Florida. And during that time, I deal with planning and zoning and regulation issues on a daily basis. So it's certainly an area that I am uh, familiar with. Um, for the last 10 years, I've owned a uh, private consulting firm that we do engineering and economic work. I spent six years on the utility advisory board. I spent four years of those as the chair of the utility advisory board. Um, I am married. I've been married for 16 years. I have two uh, early teenage daughters that, you know, have given me private debate lessons for the last couple years that I'm going to use this <laughs> evening. So. <laughs> um, I have never run for office before. This is my first time. Um, I would say I'm not an experienced politician. Everyone deals with politics all the time, but um, I look forward to um, being able to do a, a, a good job for you. Um, I am running because I feel like I've been called to serve, that um, I've had a lot of uh, people ask me to do so. I don't need to tell you what a great city this is. Being on the utility advisory board, I had a lot of support from some great uh, people. Um, to go ahead and get on, the, on on this board. So, you know, that's why this, because Winter Park is such a great city, that's why this election is so important. I am looking to be able to use my engineering background, look at the numbers, make good quality decisions to help maintain the quality of life that we have in the city so that our children, children's children can live here and enjoy it too. Thank you. Okay, we have the opening statements. Now we're going to have questions, and everybody will answer the same question. Um, but rather than go what, the way we did it, we'll start with you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Seidel, and we'll go that way. Okay, we're going to. So I'm last and first. Right. <laughs> we're gonna, Fair enough. Right. We'll we'll kind of <laughs> move it around a little bit. So the first question has to do with visit with visioning. Should citizen participation in the visioning process be limited to those who live, work, and operate businesses in Winter Park, or should the input of non-residents also be included, and why? Well, the visioning process itself, is, 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 I think it's a good idea. It's kind of what our company was set up to do, was to help 
develop plans for Florida uh, to develop SMART. So as far as bringing outside input into it, um, you know, I can say that it's good outside input is not a bad thing. As a balanced person and as an engineer, I always try and do as much investigation as I, as I can and get as much input as I can and ultimately make the right uh, decision. I think the um, visioning process um, is something that if I'm elected to the commission, that I'll be able to have more input on it and be more actively involved in it and help the process turn out to be a good one for the city of Winter Park. Okay, uh, Mr. Brewer. Yes, um, we've had a number of visioning scenarios over the, over the years. I think when I was mayor, we had one in 1994 called Winter Park in Perspective. And we met at the Langford Hotel and the community came together. And, and it's all, again, again, focuses on those core values that this community has. And what we have to do is to is to kind of clarify those. I don't think we should shut anybody out from having the conversation whether they're, you know, obviously we're going to listen to uh, residents more, uh, more than we would probably to someone that doesn't live in our community, but there are a lot of people who may work in this community that have great ideas, and I think we need to, we need to listen to Ms. Sherald. And when it all comes down to it, the city commission is gonna make the decision on that visioning plan, and along with you as, uh, as citizens. So um, I look forward to continuing uh, that program as well. Let's just make sure we don't put those on the shelf like we've done with every other visioning plan over the years. They, as soon as that gets finished, it goes, goes back into the planning department and then a new commission comes on board and they lose interest in that plan and they start off on another tangent. So um, I hope that we can find uh, some common ground and, uh, and get moving. Ms. McKinnon. I think the visioning process is going to be really, really important. And I hope that you, who obviously have an interest in civic affairs, will be a part of that. I'm a retired judge, so I like to have all the facts. Uh, I don't object to people outside of the city giving their input. I would like as much intelligent, thoughtful participation as we can possibly get. I do think more weight ought to be attributed to those who live in the city and who pay taxes and raise families and uh, are directly affected by the vision that we arrive at. Uh, so I would welcome the input of anyone who's got uh, valuable information that could affect the process, but I would certainly give more weight to the residents uh, and, and people who have businesses here. I agree with uh, Gary that the problem we may have is that we, it's a complicated process. I mean, it's really, when you read the RFP for the um, people who are helping to design this, it's so complicated, but it's so important that we have got to make sure that this doesn't end up in a blue binder sitting beside behind someone's desk at City Hall. We've got to develop something that is a living document that guides us for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Thank you. Absolutely, we should take comments from everybody. We never know where the great idea is going to come from. We can trust, uh, we can trust the, the people that we put in charge to run this process, to filter through it, to filter what's a good idea and not. Um, I, was, I either moved or seconded the amendment, uh, the, the motion to, to approve the visioning plan, so I'm proud that we're doing it. I will tell you, though, we lost, um, I lost the vote to try to have the visioning process and plan inform the next round of the comprehensive plan. Um, because, to Gary's point, I didn't want to see it sitting on a shelf. That was a big concern of mine. We're going to go through this, we're going to spend money, and it's going to sit on a shelf. We, we had a motion to try to get it to inform the comprehensive plan, the next round of the comprehensive plan, um, and I lost that. But that's okay. We win votes, we lose votes, it's all right, we move on. But I do think it will impact the next, as we go forward. Um, there's a lot of smart people on all of our boards. We have an incredible number of boards and an incredible number of, of people involved in the city. There are a number of people who work in the city who don't live in the city, who have a very large impact in the city. You can talk about some of the nonprofits, um, Rollins College, any of the businesses in the city. And they do have a, they do have a desire to see Winter Park move forward and, uh, and keep the character of Winter Park. So I'm very proud to say that I support uh, everybody participating in it, and we'll filter through it. Okay, the next question is going to be on development. 
Do you believe the city needs stricter land use rules or stricter adherence to the ones we have to limit the number of large scale, high density projects? And um, why don't we begin that with um, Mr. Brewer? And we'll okay. The, um, we have a comprehensive plan and I think we need to make sure that we are in conformance with that, obviously. Um, the, and then I guess you have to decide, you know, what is density? Is density the size of a structure or the number of structures in an area or is it the number of people who reside in the community? And uh, I think a lot of people have both views uh, on, on, that, on that issue. Um, change is inevitable. You know, if we did not change, we'd still have pine trees growing on Park Avenue. It's, I think the question is not should we grow or should we develop, but how should we develop? How do we grow? And that's the question that we all have to get, come together and find some common ground and some common interest. We have, you know, every institution has people on one side that feel strongly one way and people on the other side that feel strongly the other way. And uh, so I think you just, ha we have to work together as a community and, f and find issues that, that we can agree on. Uh, compromise. The Board of, or the Bill of Rights wouldn't exist today if, uh, if elected officials back in 1792 hadn't agreed to compromise with one another. And so that's where, I think that's where it's going to have to come. We have to stop driving each other into, their, into our corners. And the, you know, all of our government is, is polarized from the uh, Congress right on down to the state legislature and now even to our city government. We've got to get people to come back around the table and start talking to one another again. Okay. Um, Ms. McKinnon, why don't you take this? Well, I haven't made any secret of the fact that I have a, a lot of opinions on this subject, actually. Uh, I think we have uh, good land use regulations, zoning, all of that in place now. We can attract good high-end development uh, with the rules that we have in place. Uh, the best example of that right now is the Alfond. Uh, it's a terrific asset for our community. Um, no accommodations had to be given to that developer to build that beautiful project with the exception of the fact that they needed a few more parking places, I think it was 40 something, which they entered into a, an agreement with All Saints Church to work that out. So there are per certainly instances where it makes perfect sense to give exceptions to the code or to uh, the, land use, the land use regs. What I'm not in favor of is making such exceptions uh, for the developer so that you end up with uh, pack them and stack them, uh, concrete, the concrete canyon that, we, or that I call it on uh, Denning. Uh, I would never have approved that project like that. Uh, I think we need smart development on our corridors on Lee Road, Fairbanks. That's going to be difficult to do for a lot of reasons, but it's worth making the effort to do that. But I don't want to see uh, development that does not comply with the rules that we have in place now. Thank you. Every microphone works. <laughs> Every municipal plan uh, across the country has a section for variances. They're there because you can't get the code perfect every time. You never know what's going to come up. Uh, my opponent just mentioned the Alphand Inn, and she's right. It was a great example of the city working with the developer to try to find, figure out a parking solution. We actually ended up going outside of what was allowed, which was 300 feet. We went a little bit further and allowed them to take some offset parking into the SunTrust garage. They were allowed to go across the street, and they cut a deal with, with All Saints. But getting that extra parking down at, at the SunTrust garage completed that deal. We have to be able to work with, with uh, developers and property owners. We also have property rights. When we talk about the apartment building on the corner of Canton and Denning, I understand people don't like it. I'm not sure I'm crazy about it either right now, not the, the look and feel of it. But I'll tell you this. In 2006, they were given the rights to build that building. They were given the rights to build a 370,000 square foot building. They worked with the commission. We, we took 24,000 square feet out of that building. They were also allowed to build a 50,000 square foot building next door on the piece of property that's known as the public's liquor site. They're not allowed to build that anymore. So this commission worked with that developer to take a total of 75,000 square feet of volume off of the entire site. 
You may not like it. I get it. I get it. I'm not going to argue that that you know that it's that that uh, everybody's going to love it. But this commission worked with them to actually lower volume on that overall site by 74,000 square feet. Mr. Saito. Yeah, can I ask you to repeat the question, please? It's been a while. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I can only do write you, so much down. I know. Do you believe the city needs stricter land use rules or stricter adherence to the ones we have to limit the number of large-scale, high-density projects? Okay, um, you know, this is one of the areas that I look at from an engineering perspective is what we seem to have with these big developments coming in is an emotional debate. That a lot of it is centered around traffic and the change to the quality of life of our city. And so when I look at these, you know, larger high density developments that I think of, you know, there's a way that can they be done without impacting the city and how do we figure that out. One of the things that's, that's happened is I, I've talked to engineers. We don't have a detailed traffic model of our city that includes all the traffic and all the cut through streets. And this is work that can be done. I know it can be done. I've talked to several engineers about it. And so it, when in our planning process where I would say our, our rules and codes are okay, but there's things that we can add to our toolbox to help us make better decisions to decide if a variance is okay. And so if we can get that toolbox up and running, we can be looking at these things, and instead of having an emotional debate about what the change is going to be, have a more logical civil debate so that we can all have our input, and then, and then you know, determine is this the course of action that we want to go down, but we will know what the, what the traffic impact is going to be. And I think the, 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 the recent uh, development on 1792 was, in, was an, an emotional issue for people as well, but there wasn't the traffic model to discuss and have a, a, a clean discussion on it at, and, and, and decide, is this really best for us? Thank you. Well, I'll tell you what, Mr. Sedlitt, since the next question is about traffic, we'll begin with you. <laughs> as, we, as we begin the ultimate I-4 makeover, traffic will spill over into Winter Park arteries like 1792 and from there into neighborhoods. So what recommendations do you have to address Winter Park's unfavorable level of traffic congestion, especially on the north-south corridors? Well, I, I'll ditto my previous answer about the traffic model, <laughs> so I won't go through all that again. But the one thing, I, I, I did talk to the engineers at the DOT, and we have very smart people that work at the DOT, and they're already installing some real-time sensors so they can make real-time adjustments to the lights on 1792. But Living here, we all know that, trap, that I don't even show up on 1792 because I usually take the back streets. So to me, we need to now work with the DOT and look to see can we get these smart signals put on our lights that come down our street. So, you know, when we have, a, you know, I always I tell people that our traffic signals work best during the summertime because a lightning bolt knocks them out and we get a police officer standing at the <laughs> intersection and he sees every car and he tells them what to do. And so we need to get our signals functioning like that. We've done, we have smart people at the city. They can do these things. We need to give them the resources and the tools to do so. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Leary. Uh, we need regional solutions. The traffic problem in Warner Park is not caused necessarily by the residents of Warner Park. I think we all know that. It's caused by the 300,000 new residents of Seminole and Orange County in the last 10 years. We need to work with regional partners. Last evening at the commission meeting, I brought up the opportunity to possibly work at some smart signaling technology. If any of you all have been through New York City, when you get on one of the avenues going up, going north or going south, you can follow those lights. You can get 30, 40 blocks before you catch the next red light. We can do th similar smart technology like that in Winter Park, but we need to do it regionally. It's the same with quiet zones. We got quiet zones approved, but quiet zones would not be quiet zones in Winter Park if we didn't have Orlando and uh, Maitland having quiet zones either. You'd still you hear the train uh, horns from, from next door. So we need regional solutions to some of this. We also talk about traffic, and yet I think there's a lot of misunderstanding in the community. Sunrail is a great traffic abater. I mean, Sunrail is, is, is hopefully taking cars off our roads. The Lee Road extension, another great opportunity to clear congestion at one of our busiest intersections. It will get people in and out, north and south, in Winter Park a lot quicker. So there are solutions going on. We're also working with the developer of the Mount Vernon Inn and Lakeside right now to fix some signaling technologies. And again, it's not, we don't get everything right the first time, but we have an opportunity to work with developers to try to fix things as we move forward, and we're going to help clean up that intersection too. 
uh, Cynthia McKinnon. I have to go back uh, for just a moment to uh, my opponent's uh, description of the property or the, the project that I call the monstrosity on Denning. And he says, we had to do it, we could get sued, um, we were forced to uh, comply with whatever the developer wanted. But at the time that this project was being built, uh, he said, we should be celebrating. Uh, people all over the United States want a pro project like that. Uh, this is a tremendous project. Um, I agree, it's tremendous, all right. But that ar this argument that we have to do it, they're entitled to it, we could get sued, I've never heard that argument made. I've never read it in the minutes until now when we have an election coming up and everybody agrees. It's a monstrosity. Um, so I, I just don't buy that argument. Uh, as far as traffic is concerned, well, we have to face the fact that we are a small, beautiful, unique city in the midst of the number one tourist destination of the in the world. For sure, we have outside pressures on us. But, but there are many things that we can do internally. We cannot let developers offset parking across the street so that patrons have to f uh, cross 1792 five lanes to get to Trader Joe's. Uh, we can ensure that traffic studies are conducted before development begins. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Brewer. Our traffic problem is obviously, as has been pointed out, is not the fact that we have you know, 29,000 residents living in the city that are trying to traverse from Park Avenue to their home and so on. We have 350,000 people a day that drive through Winter Park. Currently, I, I, I serve as the uh, uh, chairman of the Civil Service Board that provides oversight to the uh, police and the fire departments. And that's one of the issues that we're trying to deal with every day. We've, we're, we're down four, uh, four police officers in the, uh, in the department. They were authorized in the budget, but they were not funded. Uh, and that's a difficult uh, task to try to maintain uh, the traffic, traffic control as well. Over the years, we've also tried other traffic control devices. Um, I remember for many years, we had complaints along Pennsylvania Avenue that we had, that was a cut through route. And so the residents uh, pleaded with us to uh, brick uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. Many of you probably now regret that that's been done because <laughs> we actually used two different size bricks on that roadway, so that's really very bumpy. But it, it was very effective. It did slow traffic down and people are avoiding that, that route now. And we have done other things along uh, Fairbanks and Aloma in that area to uh, help uh, uh, calm the traffic. Um, but it's going to be a problem. When they start closing down I-4, where do you think the alternative route's going to be? It's going to be 1792. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do now is move on to some questions that were from the readers. And the first one has to do with partisan versus nonpartisan. Do you think the influence of national political parties positively or negatively affects the spirit of Winter Park's traditional nonpartisan race? And if so, why? Um, and um, why don't we start with you, Cynthia? I'm just going to move around here. Why so not? <laughs> you would look right at me. I think um, since I am uh, one who's become embroiled in, in partisan politics, I would seem to be the logical one to start with this. <laughs> um, I have spent uh, 16 years as a judge, uh, during which time I am required to be independent, listen to all the facts, and make the best possible decision. Um, I am a consensus builder. I am an independent thinker. I'm also a Democrat. <laughs> 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 and I, until all of this came up, um, I had no idea on my um, huge volunteer uh, staff, who is a Democrat and who is a Republican, who is an independent, because you know what? It has nothing to do with politics in Winter Park. <laughs> uh, it's been said that she started it. Let me tell you what I started, uh, the Democratic Party, 
put up an invitation to my kickoff party on the website. Somebody in the campaign called and said, take it down. This is nonpartisan. Secondly, someone came up to me at my kickoff party and said, I'm from the Democratic Party, and we're going to help you. We can send out free mailers. You don't have to pay for them uh, if we send them out. And I said, no, no, get away. This is partisan. I do not want to be engaged in a partisan race. Oh, time, time's up. I had a lot more to say about <laughs> it. <laughs> All right, um, Mr. Leary. That's a surprise. I'm going second. Um, I stand by my statement with the with the um, Orlando Sentinel. I prefer a nonpartisan race in Winter Park. Um, I had no involvement with any of the partisan mailers that went out or emails. I made that clear in an email that followed. Um, but partisanship is here, and there are people who are going to vote for me simply because I'm a Republican, and there are people who are going to vote for my opponent simply because she's a Democrat. That's just the way it is. Um, and I, I, as I said, I would prefer it to be nonpartisan. I hope it can be nonpartisan. I've worked, I, one of my closest friends who sits next to me and I've developed a tremendous friendship over the past four years is Sarah Sprinkle, who is a Democrat. And Sarah and I get along well. And Sarah and I work together fabulously on any number of things. I have tremendous support from major Democrats in Winter Park. Jim and Alexis Pugh are major supporters of mine. And they are Democrats. I have major supporters that are Republicans. I have major supporters that are independents. It doesn't matter to me. I'm proud to represent the entire, oh, there goes this bronchitis I have, excuse me, the entire city of Winter Park, regardless of your politics. So um, I stand by my statement. I'm happy to keep this nonpartisan. Uh, Mr. Brewer. <coughs> I thought we were going to get a buy on this question since, uh, <laughs> no. since we hadn't yeah. embroiled in that debate. but. Um, <laughs> I can answer just very, very quickly. I, I've never met a pothole or an auto cart that is a Republican, a Democrat, or a Libertarian. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're dealing with issues that impact your, your lives daily. Partisan po politics has no, uh, no role in, in, in how we operate a government and city government and local communities. It's just that we need to get together and, and, and as, as I said earlier, that we need to sit down with one another and start, stop putting up no density signs and, and driving people into their corners and not having, you know, stopping all these, you know, this, uh, all the debate that we have over, over whether we should or should not. Let's get together and find out how we can, how we can solve our problems and not, you know, who should, who's to blame. That's the, that's the half the problem, so. Okay, thank you. Um. Mr. Right. Mr. Seidel. Michelle, yes. I'm going to have to ask you one more time to repeat the question, please. <laughs> Do you think the influence of national political parties positively or negatively affects the spirit of Winter Park's traditional nonpartisan race, and why? Okay. Is, so do the national politics affect our race? I, I can tell you I've heard a lot of people talking about it, so yes, there is an effect on it because they, they send flyers out and get people talking. Whether or not that has an effect on how people actually vote, I don't know that it, it does. I like to think that there's a lot of educated voters in here that are gonna evaluate all four people running for office. I think we're very fortunate we have four very qualified folks running for office as a city. Uh, and, and so to, to be in that situation is much better than the alternative. So, um, you know, p personally, I'm, you know, I'm gonna talk about Greg Seidel and what Greg Seidel can do and has done. And, you know, as Gary said, we should, you know, had a buy on this question because I think both of us we all kind of want the same things and it's just you know how we go about getting them. Um, so anyway, it's it, it is uh, to me an an area that I don't like. I I, I do avoid policy, po uh, partisan politics. You know, I'm an apolitical person. My job as a civil engineer, I, I have to deal with everybody. So that's where you know I've been able to learn to listen to both sides and, and get decisions made. Um, so yes. Thank okay, you. thank you. All right, why don't we begin with you. Uh, tree canopy. Um, with Winter Park tree budgets running on empty, what specific steps will you take to restore and maintain Winter Park's signature live oak canopy? Okay, that was me. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. I so you, you remember it? Greg or Gary. That's what I'm <laughs> Gary. So. We get confused all the time. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, you know, one of the things of, about where the city is now 
is that we have been through a rough period. Everybody has, but we're coming out of that rough period. So when you when you talk about the the, the tree budget and what can be done for the tree canopy, you know, mo moving forward, we've had some of these commercial developments that they're talking about, right? So we 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 should be in improving our tax base for the years to come. So I want to take a look at, at at the budget that's going to be coming up. But at the same time, the other thing we can do uh, for the trees is you know accelerating the under uh, the undergrounding program itself is, is is we do have a way to make the trees that we have look better and more healthy by not having you know to cut them for the uh, for the uh, um, electric wires um, but you know getting money into those budgets it's what our priorities are you know I'm for efficient government I'm not for raising taxes I, I look to you know, if we can make our government more efficient and we prioritize and we reprioritize our funds to the areas that are important to us. So that, that's what I would look to do is, uh, you know, trees are important to me. So I would look to try and prioritize some more of our funds to go towards the trees, but we have to balance that with where we get those funds from. Okay, um, Mr. Brewer, same question, tree canopy. Tree canopy, obviously everybody has a picture of a tree on their signs yeah, these right. days, so that is a, <laughs> certainly a very important component of our community. It all goes back, all, most of the, you know, most of the uh, tree programs have really been citizens initiatives, going back to, uh, to Capon, when he went along Park Avenue and planted the first uh, oak trees along uh, our streets. Uh, a beloved citizen that just passed away recently, Kenneth Murrah, has a a, a fund at the Community Foundation for tree replacements. Uh, another citizen established a fund many years ago, or a number of years ago, that uh, uh, was a live oak fund. But all of these had one thing in common, they were, they were citizens' initiatives. Uh, the city has uh, sold some of its equipment, has outsourced the tree trimming, uh, they sold that equipment, that is what is now funding our tree replacement. We're taking down 50, uh, or we're taking down 200 trees and we're putting up 50. Uh, uh, you know, a tree has a, takes seven generations to grow, and we now are, are beginning to see the results of that because they were all planted back uh, around the turn of the century, a, a year ago, about 100 years ago. So, um, yes, it's a very important. I think we also have to look at the coverage and not necessarily placing a tree for a tree. Uh, we, go, we go, go back and forth. We started requiring people to, uh, a huge fee to take a tree down, and now we're, now we're going in just the opposite way. We need to find a central, uh, centrist position on, on this. Okay, Ms. McKinnon. Well, a lot of you all have heard me talk about this already. Trees are a, a pretty big deal to me. Uh, you're probably going to hear in a minute that we have a new urban forestry plan. It's not new. We've had a plan in the city of Winter Park for decades to take care of our trees. Uh, we had at one point a forestry department, we've had a forestry department since the 50s. It had uh, very lately 14 people and a million dollar budget. We no longer have a forestry department anymore. They've gradually uh, been laid off, retired, fired, gotten rid of, whatever. Um, this admit the present administration cut $100,000 from uh, the forestry division uh, a couple of years ago. This year, $100,000 was reinstated, but it was Commissioner McMacken's uh, motion that did that because he's another, another one who w is worried about the trees. Um, my opponent voted to remove the city's responsibility for maintenance of right-of-way trees uh, from the new urban tree plan. Right-of-way trees are the only trees we have exclusive control over. They're what makes the canopy. Uh, I would reinstate uh, the city's responsibility to that. And this outsourcing of maintenance includes a provision called One Touch. The companies doing that are supposed to come in one time. That re results in those grotesque Y cuts you see in the trees because they don't ha have to come back for seven or eight years. If we're gonna outsource it, if that's a good idea economically, it needs to be no one-touch policy anymore. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Leary. Folks, this is the, my opponent set it up perfectly for me. This is the first urban forestry management plan the city of Winter Park has ever had in 125 years. 
my opponent mentioned at the last debate that that's not true, that we've had an inventory in 1998 and an inventory in 2004. Counting of trees is not a plan. We took the next step and we actually created a plan. We looked around and we said there's 10,000 dead trees, dead, diseased, and dying that need to come down. Because personally, I'm more worried about taking down trees that are dangerous to our residents. There are pictures across the city of trees that have fallen on cars. You can probably walk outside of your street and see big logs that have fallen nearby on your sidewalk. That is much bigger concern of, of mine right now than whether I plant a tree in 2014 or 2016. Because in 20 years, you're not gonna tell the difference whether that tree was planted in 14 or 16. But you'll remember if somebody got killed by a tree that fell. So yes, I'm much more concerned about taking down dangerous trees. Secondly, fourth quarter performance measurement report right here. In 2014, we removed 729 trees and replaced them with 350. That's a two for one, that's 48%. So we're not taking, we're not at a three for one, we're not at a greater number, we're replacing two for one. And again, it's important. And once we get down those dangerous trees, we have two years left of that, we'll be able to take that budget that we're setting aside to taking down trees and putting it back into planting more trees. I seconded Commissioner McMacken's approval or amendment, so I'm very proud of that. Oh, I got so much more. <laughs> All right, we're moving on to land use. What is your position regarding building height requirements along Park Avenue and in the central business district. Um, anybody want to volunteer to go first? <laughs> okay, Ms. Deliri, it's yours. Thank you, because I'm gonna finish up my trees really quickly. <laughs> um, just quickly, the, uh, we have contractors. Our contracting budget, we are getting, it's, we do have a forestry department still. Uh, we don't have the guys on the, we don't have the street, uh, the guys in the trucks taking down trees because we're doing it a heck of a lot more efficiently with contractors. And that's why you need folks who look at you, the bottom line, we are doing it a lot more efficiently. Uh, so in our contracting budget is up 82% over about eight years. Our contractors are working better. We don't have the overhead, we don't have the insurance challenges with a forestry department. So our contractors are working a heck of a lot better than, than staff was. Uh, land use, at Park Avenue, I heard this four years ago when I ran. And by the way, I had, I had oak trees on my sign four years ago when I ran too. So. I've been, a, I've been a tree fan for years. Um, we heard that we were gonna have, Steve's a big developer. And I say to people, point, something, point to something Steve has developed. I'm not a developer. I told you the businesses I own and occasionally I invest in small buildings, but I'm not a developer. I heard I was gonna tear down Park Avenue and build four and six story buildings. Hasn't happened, it's not gonna happen. I have no, no desire to see it happen. I moved to Winter Park to raise my family in Winter Park because I love Winter Park. I am not planning on changing downtown. And so as far as land use and increase in the size of the downtown, no desire whatsoever. It won't happen with me. Ms. McKinnon. One more thing on trees. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did have a tree plan. We, the city was divided into four sectors. <clears throat> there were three and four man crews assigned to three of the sectors. The fourth sector never got funded and the dismantling of all of this began. You probably remember Lee Mackin and John Lupo here for 30 plus years. You called them up, they came out, they advised you on what to do. We had a plan and it was working. This, these Y cuts, that's a new thing. Now, um, land use and high rises on Park Avenue, I'm not actually sure where that idea ever even came from for a question. I haven't heard any of the four of us ever say that we thought we ought to have high rises on Park Avenue. Of course we don't want high rises on Park Avenue. Uh, I would like to see taller buildings near I-4. If that's where we're going to do um, taller buildings, that makes perfect sense to have that happen on Lee Road and on Fairbanks, but I don't think any of us. Can you imagine if we came to you and said, oh, is it okay if we put up a six-story building on Park Avenue? None of us is that stupid, believe me. Uh, we don't want it and we would never ask for it. So that, I don't think that's an issue in our city. Okay. Well, until 1968, there were no height limitations on Park, on Park Avenue and the result of that was what is now the Bank of America building and, um, mm -hmm. uh, and the citizens uh, in instituted that um, uh, uh, height limitation at that time. Uh, 
the, you know, the debate over height limitation, in fact, you know, I, I obviously, I, I was uh, the mayor when we did raise the height limitations to three stories. Uh, that's what gave us a SunTrust Plaza and with, and where, uh, where, the, where the elementary school used to be and the park building where my store, uh, Jacobson's uh, uh, store used to be. And the Colony Theater is a three-story building. It's not, it's not the, you know, what we learned back then, it's not the height that this <laughs> bothers people, it's the scale and how it fits in with the community and how it's designed. What they did with the Bank of America building to put a new face on that, Everybody loves that building now. Uh, the, uh, and everybody holds up the SunTrust Plaza as a great example of architecture. And we worked with that developer to, to set back the second and third stories a little bit and put some design, you know, design features. So it's not the height, it's the scale and a character that the building. Just like I use the Winter Park Village as a good example in 1994 when they developed that. They came to us with a large uh, asphalt parking lot with about 10 uh, big box stores surrounding that, that piece of property. It would have looked like the Colonial Plaza. We see, and they have the same design rules that we have today, but we worked with them. Yes. I do remember I the question You're, this time. Yeah, do I have to, you want me to repeat it? I wrote it down for you just in case. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, you know, I was at one of the commission meetings when they were debating changing the ordinances with regards to the buildings on Park Avenue. And it was a pretty impassioned debate that I was listening to. And you know, what I, what I got out of that was, and, and hearing all the folks here tonight, is that you know, we do have rules in place to protect the character of Park Avenue, but at the same time, you know, we should let developers come in with an opportunity to sell us on what they're trying to do and give them the opportunity to put something up that we feel is a good quality development. But if we go changing the rules so we don't have that, the, the power to enforce those things, then we're just gonna let the, those things happen. Um, so, you know, I am, you know, the way the sun shines in on Park Avenue, that's one of the issues with the building setbacks that they have. Um, you know, it, it is, my office is a block off of Park Avenue. I, I tell everyone I got the greatest drive in the world because I'm coming around Lake Virginia through Rollins College and then right up Park Avenue. And, you know, you see the sunrise coming up, you see over the building, you see it going into the parks. And it, it's certainly one of the, the great qualities uh, 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 um, items that Winter Park has. And I certainly don't think we should be doing any change, anything that was, is, is going to take that away from us. Thank you. Okay. This in, last question is a very interesting question. <laughs> it's about the Affordable Care Act. Under the Affordable Care Act, we have the opportunity to eliminate city employees' health plans, which cost the taxpayer roughly $10,000 per year per employee. Instead, we can pay a $2,500 fine and help city employees find their own health insurance. The savings amounts to nearly $4 million a year. As a steward of our tax dollars, would you be willing to explore this course of action? <laughs> This came from apparently one of the readers. So, anyway, um, <laughs> Miss McKinnon, how about you taking that? <laughs> lucky, lucky, lucky me. Yeah. Um, this is honestly something that I have not thought a whole lot about. <laughs> Let me be frank about that. Mm -hmm. But if you say we could save four million dollars, we cannot afford not to even think about this. On the other hand, I don't want our employees, for us to lose employees that we value because they can't get health care. Uh, so that would be an issue. Um, I really, without knowing more about the economic impact that this would have, uh, I really don't feel comfortable saying yes or no. Uh, I think th there's no question, I mean, we're, we're very in very good financial shape. I agree with my opponent on that. Uh, we don't have to look at any drastic measures in order to maintain a solvency in our city. Um, Four million dollars sounds like a lot of money but we are in good financial shape. I don't think we have to look at drastic cost cutting. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but if there is a substantial savings, it's probably something that we ought to look at. But I'm not real enthusiastic about that idea without knowing more about it. Okay. Um, Mr. Leary. Well, uh, we obviously don't, this is coming from a reader, so I have no idea to verify <laughs> those numbers. Uh, so, but I think anyone up here that says they wouldn't look at possibly saving the citizens of Winter Park $4 million, um, I don't think anybody up here is gonna say that. So, uh, so certainly we'd look at it, but we definitely make, we have 500 employees who are critical uh, to the success of this city. We're a strong city manager form of government. They work hard, they're out there. We have to do what's best for them. Uh, but if it's $4 million, we certainly have to look at it. I'm gonna go back really quickly. Uh, my opponent mentioned Paseo and the apartment complex, so I will give you just quickly in regards to getting sued. I have an email here from the city attorney that says if an owner had vested rights or a reasonable commercial expectation of how he could develop the property in 2006 in terms of height, far, and units per acre, and thereafter the 2009 comp plan reduced far units per acre or height, then a Burt Harris Act violation would likely have existed at the time. That means if we took somebody's rights away in 2009 that they had vested since 2006, we could get sued. And if you don't think that's true, talk to Ponce Inlet. They're on the south side of a $50 million lawsuit because a developer had, they were granted rights to build something and the city took those rights away. And this is gonna bankrupt that city. So when we talk about lawsuits and possibly taking people's property rights away from them, I take that very seriously. Whether or not I like the project is really not relevant. It's got to do, am I gonna put you in jeopardy for $50 million lawsuit and you won't get that from me. Okay, uh, Mr. Mr. Berg. Uh. I, I didn't know if we were going which way then, but. Um. Uh, <coughs> I'll make this simple. Uh, at, at the risk of injecting partisan politics into this, I don't know what it has to do with the citizen city of Winter Park, but uh, I would repeal the Affordable Care Act. Um, <laughs> and the answer would be, the answer would be no. So I don't okay. think we need to go any further than that. <clears throat> All right. Um, would you like to take it, Mr. Seidel? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure where I want to go with this one. Yeah. Um, yeah. If I made jokes, would they get quoted as jokes, or would they be quoted as actually <laughs> political things I said? Yeah. Um, you know, the as a business owner, I'm going to tell you all that I have dealt with insurance, and I've what I have seen in my 10 years is my insurance rates go up 20% per year, and my um, uh, the portion that I have to pay go from $250 a year to $6,000 per year on my uh, um, deductibles. So, uh, you know, to me, when you talk about transferring the employees from the current health, health, health program that they have to a health program that is, is, not, is going to be more similar to what I am dealing with, you know, that is going to make our, the quality of life in Winter Park go down because those are the people that work for us and those are the people that make our city great. That's what we have to remember. It's, you know, we all live here, but those people work for our city and, 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 and they're, you know, they're the ones that take care of us. So you have to look at it from both perspectives, but is there a savings we could come up with that a, 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 a comparable plan can work? And, you know, this isn't just this one issue. I mean, there's issues all over the city with, rising health care costs. I mean, if you think about the real estate bubble that happened, that, you know, real estate kept going up and up and up until it couldn't sustain it anymore. At some point, you know, we've got to get our health coverage under control because as a business owner, you know, 20% increases every year and rising deductibles is just not sustainable. So, you know, all that, all that, all that being said, you know, my first thought is I want, you know, these are the people that work in the city that I live and I want them to be happy and I want them to do a good job for me. So that's what I would look is, is you know, what other insurance issues are, are they facing? And is there something where maybe we do a half and half? Maybe there is something where we can get them on the other programs, but we provide them with enough funding to cover it, and we still come out a million dollars ahead, and they're on the new insurance program. So really got to look into those issues and see if we can figure out something that's ultimately good for everybody. Okay, those are the questions. Thank you very much. We're now going to have a two-minute um, closing statement by each candidate. Uh, Mr. Leary, we'll start with you. I held my card up to talk to my card. Uh, it's been a long night. Thank you all for being here again. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you to The Voice uh, for pulling this together. We really do appreciate it, and the League of Women Voters for, uh, for moderating. Uh, quick thank you. What I, what I want to say is I want to give you a recap of my four years on the commission. 
We're all for finance, making sure our finances are great. We have not raised tax rates in this city in six years. Through a very difficult economy just a couple years ago, we now have 100% occupancy on Park Avenue. We have $12.3 million in the bank. And we have 28% of our general fund in reserve. We've done a great job managing your, managing your money, and I'm proud of that. Secondly, the improvements. We've talked about how we're going to take care of some of the improvements in the city of Winter Park. Our parks, as I said before, 2013 gold medal award. We've done a good job with our parks. On, on our corridors, one of my promises, I went up to Tallahassee a couple of years and got $12 million set aside to underground the power lines on Fairbanks from I-4 to 1792. And if you have any question on that, talk to Sarah Sprinkle, talk to the other commissioners that know that, that I led that charge. And I will tell you, Mead Gardens, $400,000 that I went up to Tallahassee last year and got allocated into the budget. I have worked hard to make sure that we get improvements of the city. <coughs> Lastly, development. We talked about Fairbanks. My opponent mentioned Fairbanks, and she's right. That's where that development goes, and that's why we spent so much time getting, getting Fairbanks ready. Sewer out there, we can assemble properties. We have taken down billboards, and we'll get those transmission lines underground too. That's where the development goes, not downtown in our core. One quick thing, you know, that there was, I watched The American President a couple of years ago, and Michael Douglas said in, a, in, in the movie, in his speech, there's one way to get elected. There's a sure way. That is make people afraid and tell them who to blame for it. That's not leadership. That may get you elected. That's not going to get you. That doesn't set the course for leadership. I've set my, I've set my course the past four years. I've, led, I've helped lead this city. I'm proud of our accomplishments, and I would appreciate your votes. We can keep going with all the great things we've been doing. Thank you all very much. Cynthia McKinnon. The statement that uh, my opponent read about Bert Harris and the statement of the law, that's a correct statement of the law. I'm a lawyer. I understand that. Those are not the facts that the commission was dealing with at the time. And um, my opponent says he's, he's very proud of his record. I, I, with all due respect, I'm uh, thinking sooner or later he'll take credit for $2 gas. Uh, Mead Gardens and undergrounding was a community, was a city and um, commission initiative. We have two lobbyists in Tallahassee. Last night, the uh, legislative priorities were brought up for everybody, or everybody on the commission to agree on. Uh, Commissioner Sprinkle said, let's make, let's, all of us, the commission, make Mead Gardens phase two, our number one priority. That's a commission priority. Everybody likes to feel that they've made a huge contribution to our city. We all want to think that we're special and we've done it all. But this is a communal effort. Proud of a record. Proud of a traffic choke, 1792. Proud of a uh, Trader Joe's where people have to walk across five lanes of busy traffic. Mm -hmm. Proud of the concrete canyon that we have now on Denning. Proud of voting for a, a comp, plan, comp plan change that would have allowed uh, larger buildings on all four lane roads, including Lake Mont. Uh, proud of cutting social and cultural programs in Winter Park in favor of $1 million to an Orlando uh, Performing Arts Center. Um, proud of no forestry department. Here's my plan. No new plans on trees with no substance. Return to a real plan with teeth and a staff and money. Development. No more of the same pack them and stack them. Change the perception that Winter Park is for sale. Return citizen boards to representation by all of people like you and eliminate the buddy system. Thank you. Mr. Brewer. Well, first let me close by thanking um, Greg and Cynthia and, and Steve for offering themselves to public service. It's a huge time commitment, believe me, and I, I know I've been there, and I, I look forward to returning to the, to the City Commission. Uh, I love Winter Park. It's been my home for nearly 40 years, and, um, and, and I, I, I want to be a part of it again. You know, everything is like I was saying earlier. You know, there's th kind of three streams. You've got, of, of any, or, you know, any organizations you belong to, there's a, 
a group on this side that feels very strongly one way, and you have another group of people on the other side that feels almost just the opposite the other way, and then you have a large stream in the middle that either are very happy or they're content or they don't really care. The role of the city commission is to try to bring, and your elected officials in any government, is to bring those two uh, groups back into the mainstream and find solutions for that. I'm a collaborative leader. Uh, I think 30 years in retail business taught me that uh, my boss always said that the customer is always right, even when she's wrong. Uh, get even with her and get her, get her back in the store to buy something new. So I, so I want to work together. When, when I was mayor, I, after, I was frustrated by the, how the city commission functioned with advisory boards. I offered uh, every commissioner the opportunity to, to because the, the charter says the mayor shall appoint and the commission will, will approve. I offered a suggestion to allow every city commissioner to, to appoint a, a, a delegate to the, to the board and then I would appoint them and they would have to confirm them. I thought that brought more diversity to our advisory board, so we had a, a more ideas that were shared. They weren't just from the mayor. Uh, who and People on those advisory boards were not there just because they agreed with the mayor. They were there because they represented you as a citizen. And I think that's a fair way to do that. And that was reversed uh, shortly after I left office. But I would encourage the mayor uh, in, the, in the new, um, new next year to reinstate that policy. But I thank you for your vote and ask you to uh, return me to the Winter Park City Commission. Thank you. Um, I do like to consider myself a quick learner, and I see everyone standing up, so I've, I've taken note. <laughs> and I'm going to stand up for my final two minutes. So thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I don't have to convince anyone in this room that Winter Park is a one-of-a-kind, you know, truly special place. We all live here. That's why we live here. Okay, and so that's why, to me, this election is so important. We have decisions that we're facing in the next few years that will be crucial to what the city is going to look like, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years from now. And as an engineer and a businessman, I do approach things a little differently uh, than a politician might. You know, I'm focused on making informed, numbers-based uh, choices for our city that will not only secure our future, but protect the quality of life that we have here. Um, we're fortunate, you know, we are fortunate that the issues our city faces have solutions. You know, there's a lot of other cities in a, in a, in a lot worse phases than we are. So uh, we, we can get pulled together and come up with good uh, solutions for this city. You know, I want to be a city commissioner that is going to, uh, you know, listen, inform myself on issues, and be part of a conversation that creates solutions for some of these issues. I look, um, and, and discussing these uh, solutions can make Winter Park even better than it is. And, you know, by humbling, er and I would hope I can humbly earn your vote on March 10th. And uh, remember, on March 10th, the please side with Seidel. Thank you. <laughs> I, I want to I wanna thank all the candidates and um, everybody who came. Um, this has been a wonderful debate. And Anne wants to say something. I, too, want to thank the, the candidates. We have four absolutely wonderful choices, and we are fortunate as a city. Um, there, would members of the press please go in the poor back room where you, you now get banished back there, and the candidates will meet you there in five minutes. Thank you to every single one of you for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it.